So we did look at this chapter last week, but I know some of you weren't here, and we did give rather much a sort of overview, uh, really, uh, quite a lot of maybe theology, uh, explaining really that how this great story of where Peter goes to meet a man called Cornelius, who is a um, centurion, he's in charge of soldiers, and then how um, th how this is, he's the first, it's, it's not so much that he's a centurion, but that he's not Jewish. The church up till this stage of Acts chapter 10 was all Jewish people. I think even the Ethiopian eunuch was a, was a Jewish man from Ethiopia that went there. So this was a big stage in the development. The gospel was always promised in the Old Testament, but it was always promised that Abraham would be the father of many nations and that when the Saviour came it would also be to the Gentiles, not just for Israel, you see it in the prophets, but to the Gentiles, which is to people like us who weren't part of that Old Testament family which became a, which became a nation, started with, with Abraham really, but you could go back to Adam and Eve and then to Noah and then Abraham and then to Jacob, whose name's Israel, who's, his name is called Israel, so that you think of a country, but you're thinking of a person, and then God revealed himself when other people were cut off from God. You think, well, how can I ever find out about God? Well, God's got to show himself to you. And so it was. there was a few people, maybe... A, maybe more than a few, who joined the Jews. They became Jews and they were able to do that either by marriage or they were able to become uh, a Jewish people. And um, so uh, that was happening. But the question was then when Jesus came and then after Jesus came, uh, and then Pentecost and the preaching, well, people were coming from all around, but there, was, there became an interest from others and um, eventually the Apostle Paul goes and preaches to all sorts of people in all sorts of countries. But it was important how this happened, how it would happen. It had to be done by God's will. It had to be done in God's way. And it, it was also, as we'll see in this chapter in the next few weeks, it was specially done in a way to get some... Um, to give it authority, it, it, was, it was a complete change. The Jewish people weren't even allowed to be associated with anyone else in the world. They, they weren't to be friends with them. So that's why the parable, you remember the parable of the Good Samaritan, it was such a shock to teach them, yes, you've still got to love your neighbours and those people who aren't part of your church or whatever it is. And we all, just everybody, a little bit of calm and quiet, and we can concentrate because it makes it hard for me as well as everyone else if people are talking and things like that. It's hard. We've got to concentrate on what we're talking about here. So um, that's all. It doesn't take too much, right? But so it happened here in this section through a man called Peter. You know about Peter, the great apostle, but never a pope, was he? and through a man called Cornelius. <laughs> now, what I want to just concentrate on this morning is Cornelius himself. So that's easy, hopefully. Rather than all about everything that happened and why it happened and why it wasn't Paul that did this and all that. We talked a bit about that last time. But you can, you can catch up with that some other time if you like. Now, Cornelius, his name means a horn. If that's a strange name, call someone Horn. <laughs> well, in you remember in Luke chapter one, where we sing actually, don't we? In the um, in the prayer book, we sing the song of uh, Zacharias. It's uh, in the prayer book. It's page ten, and it says, "Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He hath visited and redeemed His people, and hath raised up a mighty salvation for us." in the house of his servant David. Well, that is an old uh, Tyndale translation, I believe. 
but it's older than our authorised version, goes back to the 16th century, and in, the, in our Bible it says, I've raised up a horn of salvation, but the word which Tyndale uses, the horn, means strength, it means might, basically. So you can think of Cornelius as a, a man whose name means that he's not just a horn, that would look a bit odd, but he's mighty. Um, there's probably equivalent words we could use that aren't literal. So he's a mighty man by his name, of course. People don't always live up to their name. But in fact, he was a centurion, which means he's in charge of a hundred soldiers, which if you think, you might think of a company, a business. If you've got a hundred employees, it's quite a substantial responsibility. The same with a, a captain of, or a, a centurion in the army and he was part of the Italian or Roman uh, band it says in chapter 1 there which is a part of a legion several bands make up a legion of several thousand uh, soldiers but this section of them was in Caesarea which was a, a town uh, that had been built largely by Herod established and um, it had to have some kind of Roman guard there just to keep an eye on things so that was what Cornelius was doing so if the town behaved themselves like the police they can sit around uh, playing games or whatever really, they can relax so Cornelius was very wise he he looked after the people very well so he kept the place as they say keep them sweet so it kept everyone quiet and uh, things were going well for him, although he'd have probably rather have been back in Italy where there was all the thi all the fine things of life there. But then a centurion with this job, he could really use it to his advantage. He could live really quite luxuriously and just be a very, and have all sorts of things going on which we won't go into describing uh, for his own pleasure. But um, he was a devout man, it says in chapter verse 2 Cornelius was a devout man now this is interesting because for a centurion to be a devout man is is a um, he's something must have happened to him what it means here, he, he is seeking after God he's got everything in life that he needs he's well provided for but he's seeking after God and um, he doesn't necessarily, he doesn't know at this point about the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's obviously joined himself to a group of Jewish people or he's got a Jewish friend. Somehow he's found out about the Bible of some sort, the Old Testament. He knows something about it and he wants to worship the true God. He's realised, and I wonder whether we've realised this, I hope that's partly why we're here today. We've realised that in the world all the things you could have can't actually satisfy you. In the um, book of Ecclesiastes, King Solomon, when he had really, really rich, he had everything. He'd invented and made great gardens and palaces and he had everything. Lots of, lots of gold and silver and servants and buildings, got, uh, the landscapes and he studied everything. Very interesting man. He knew all about animals and plants and everything and people and how to deal with people. But he realised that when he died, he'd leave it to someone else. It's all, what's he got really? So he said that the first thing we need is the fear of God to, and wisdom from God. We, we, we need God's wisdom. So people do come to this. Sometimes, even great people. Often you think, well, Jesus said it's the poor people who will enter the kingdom of heaven first. It's the harlots, the, the prostitutes, the tax, tax... The people who have done really horrible things. They, you see, well, it, in some ways it's easy for them because they realise how, like the prodigal son, how disgusting it is to be wanting to be eating the pig's food. You think, well, I've really come to this level. I can see my... I really... If there's a God there, I want to know this God. But it, it, it happens as well with people who are very successful, as uh, Cornelius is here, and he realises that in this world, all the gods of this world, they can't 
they can't do the thing, they can't, that there's something missing, at least. Plus, he may have known that there must be a real God who's a creator of the world. We, we are, we're made, people are amazing because we're made by God. We're not just evolved splodge out of, out of nothing going nowhere and that's it. There's more to life. So people realise this, and they, so they've invented. So they go, well, where can we find out a god? And the the world that's away from God, they've they they invent gods. Well, let's make someone into a sort of god that flies through the air, and we'll dream about how this can help us, this great superpower, and we'll pray we'll pray to him. But the gods of the Roman the Roman and Greek Empire had these sort of gods, uh, but they were all fake gods. They were like human beings, weird, strange human beings. I imagine them, wow, power. But it was fake. But he, he realised that the Jewish people had a God that had helped them. He'd saved them out of Egypt from a thousand so years before. And he's the God of Abraham. And there were people who knew this real God, who worshipped him. And the, the God of creation that had had a compassion and a power to help people that turn to him. So this is what um, Cornelius was like. He was a devout man. And th th we can think of others in, in the Bible. Think of the beginning of when Jesus was born. Think of uh, Joseph, Mary's uh, husband. He's described as a just man. And then there's Zacharias and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist. They're described as righteous. Then there's Simeon, do you remember the old man Simeon in the temple? He had a promise that when Jesus came, the, when the Saviour came, he'd be able to take him and hold him. And he said that the nunc dimittis, Lord, let thy servant now depart in peace, that I've seen thy salvation. And Simeon describes as a just and a just, that's righteous and devout man. The same, a devout man. And there was Anna. She'd been a widow for many years. She spent her whole time in the temple and doing good things and serving God. She was in, in that introduction to the Gospel of Luke as well. So there were devout people and Cornelius wanted, he could tell. Um, you've heard the story from our friend, haven't you? Um, Roland Bevan, who's God willing to be here in, uh, I think, on the in the morning after Easter, he um, he tells that story, isn't he, about at that wedding he went to, and he was on one table, and the Christians were on the other table, and he said, "I knew I was on the wrong table. I wanted to be on that side of the room. I was with the worldly people, and I knew they were. He knew they were, they were the people he wanted to be with. He wanted to be with the people that knew God." Now, I've, I've probably always had a sort of religious interest myself before I was a Christian, but I, I wasn't a de, it wasn't really a devout uh, person at all. But um, th these sort of people aren't necessarily converted. Not necessarily, they haven't actually had a, uh, they've had some, there's something going on. And I, I, I hope there's something all going on with you that you're seeking the Lord. It says that if you... Um, Jesus promised that those that seek him will find him. So do seek the Lord. Do be serious and devout. There's a promise in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 where it uses this same, well this word for devout, it's not used very frequently. There's other indications of devout people. But in 2 Peter chapter 2 and Verse 9, it talks of the godly. It's actually speaking of the same word. That God will, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly, or the devout, out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the death judgment, to be punished. See, but how he would deliver the godly, the devout. Those that seek after God, he'll deliver them. Now, of course, a person has to really come to Jesus Christ. But we, we see that's this is in the process of, of happening here. Um, the other thing we read about um, 
<coughs> Cornelius is that he he isn't just a devout person as if he wants to find out about God. He feared God. He says he, a devout man and one that feared God. Now you think, well, that sounds horrible. That sounds strange. But we're, it's very important because if we don't really have a fear of God now I'll, I'll explain the word a bit more in a minute if we don't really have a fear of God a, a very this is a very serious attitude that we must do what's right with God or we'll be in trouble if, they, if that's not our attitude then we'll be like the people that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 10 Matthew chapter 10 I just turn to that and to verse 26 where it says fear them not for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hidden that shall not be known what I tell you in darkness that speak ye in the light and what ye hear in the air that preach ye upon the housetops and fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, that's pretty severe, isn't it? Fear God who could destroy body and soul in hell. That's what Jesus says. Wow. You better make sure you're right with God. But the interesting thing is that it's, it's, it's set in that opposition don't fear people. Uh, it doesn't mean you're going to be doing silly things and nasty things. No, not at all. But don't be afraid of what they might do to you. Don't be afraid that potentially someone could kill you if you don't do what they say. If there's a choice, you've got to do what God says. Thankfully, most of the time, we can do things we can love people in a ways that they'll accept and be kind and they're not going to threaten to kill us for it but when there are situations where a Christian could be afraid anyone could be afraid and they say I must do that because of so and so but they must put God first that's what it means here to fear God we must do what's right with God and occasionally hopefully not too often but occasionally and as you if you if you really dedicate your life to serving God in Jesus Christ, you will find that there are more challenges about doing the right thing, saying the right thing. Um, pastors in churches, when they're, if they're successful and they get on television and they have presented between someone, uh, and they got the TV presenter there, and they're trying to be nice to everyone, and they say, well, do you... Do you really believe that people would go to hell if they don't turn to Jesus Christ? And they sometimes they, they end up saying, well, there might be some other way we don't really... Or they say, well, yeah, if they're good people and that sort of thing. But if we fear God, we can't say that. We can't back down from what God has said, that, that he will, he will uh, 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 and can and does destroy both soul and body in hell so we must have a fear of God that that we're not afraid of people now um, we, we could know. go into that subject for quite some depth but this is what uh, Cornelius was because if you think about it Cornelius was a centurion maybe there were times when he wanted to pray to the real God and he would even even would refuse to do some of the things that the Roman soldiers would typically do. He wasn't one of the lads. He could have been promoted to above a centurion to be the leader of the band, to be the leader of the legion. He was obviously a very good and capable man. People respected him. But when it came to it, he'd say, no, there are certain things I won't do because I fear God. I must do the things that are right with God. Now, that's a challenge for all of us. There will be... Uh, difficult choices to make as Christians things concerning one of the th things concerning what happens on Sundays that it's the Lord's Day and that's one example where the world tries to get us to do everything else we must say no it's the Lord's Day and then 
uh, there may be other, there may be other things as as well. We may be um, I, I can't think of things that particularly at at, at the moment. Uh, well, as it, as you're young, if you're young, you find young people. Oh, come and come and do this with us. Let's come. We're going to go and rob a bank. Do you want to come? No, I don't do that. I fear God. No, I don't go and rob a bank because I might get caught. I go. And, I don't rob a bank because it's wrong. Because God says so. A little boy once, uh, a friend told us about his grandson. You know, his son went into into a shop with another little boy. The little boy said, "Let's steal a sweet." And the little boy said, "No, thou shalt not steal." That's what the Bible says. Thou shalt not tell lies. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not want things that aren't yours. We've got to say no to those sorts of desires. So. These commandments of God are good, and if we fear God, we want to keep his commandments. Well, that's what Cornelius was like. This centurion, he feared God. And the amazing thing with his, um, with his fearing God was that it also says that he feared God with all his house. Now, his the, when you use the word house in the Bible, it means your household. So everyone in there. So it includes really his um, everyone he's responsible for, his hundred soldiers, their families as well. They 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 may be included in this. Any servants he has, children, his wife, they're all included in his house, and they all feared God together. It's a lovely thing when that happens. It's it's the ideal when the family are together. And they follow the leader, the father, in the home, uh, and and then they fear God together, and then you have a happy home. It's amazing, and uh, God is is with them to bless. And we see this with Abraham when Abraham was called in Genesis 18 and verse 19. God knew Abraham. Now. Before you get discouraged, if you are not thinking, I'm not very devout, I'm not very God-fearing, well, you want to hear the gospel, you want to turn to Jesus Christ, but God doesn't only choose people who are very, very, <coughs> but he does know about them. So you, so you see here, for example, when Genesis 18, verse 19, when he's speaking about what Abraham will be, he says, for I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. Now, the, the blessing was promised to Abraham but God knew that Abraham would, would command his family to be godly. Now, you can't make someone a Christian. You can't force someone to be a Christian but you can lead them in the way um, with a gentle admonition and um, encouragement. It's what we hope for with our, our children and our families and, and any others that we, we have an influence on. Really, The house, you, we, we can't command other people, but we want to have that influence and set that example. That You say, well, we can't, we can't we, we've got no authority over anybody. I've got some of you, you say, well, I'm single, I'm on my own. But it's a devout person that fears God does have an influence on, on other people. And you can inspire others, even if you can't tell them. That's what we, we um, hope for as well. And then in, in uh, Joshua, there's a similar example. He said, me and my household, we will follow the Lord. So that's that example. And in fact, we'll see later on, in this passage, but the great blessing that came because when Cornelius had to send some servants off to Peter, he knew uh, particularly. He sent two of his household servants. Verse seven. When he was called, he was called. The angel appears. Send, send these. Um, go and get Peter. Was the command. Well, Cornelius stayed where he was. But he, could, he sent two of his household servants and a devout soldier. Now, I've not been in the army, 
but I've heard from Christians that have been in the army that it's pretty rough. They're a pretty rough bunch and they don't always, we're thankful for our soldiers, of course, but they, they, can, be, they can be pretty, pretty bad in, in a certain way. But, and a devout soldier, one that kneels down at his bed and prays at night, gets mocked. But here in, with Cornelius, the people had respect for him. Obviously, he'd, he'd, he'd earned this respect, as we'll see it in, in a minute, by being kind as well. He, all come, it's, it's a great person. You think, it's amazing. But he could send a devout soldier. He had a soldier he could trust to take his men there, who was also a God-fearing man. And that must have been due to Cornelius's influence to, to have such people there among him, because he led them. It commanded his his household. He 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 inspired them. This is the way. Follow God. We'll be a good bunch of soldiers. I'll look after you. You look after me. I could tell you a story about my dad when he when he when he had employees and how he looked after them and said, "I'll treat you better than any trade union." And he did. And they respected him, and it went well with him. But anyway, that's another story. But um. But it, it, it is the way to go, and this is the way Cornelius was, particularly devout and fearing God. You think, well, today people are going to laugh at it, but you, you see the, the problems that there are with getting someone to go to work, and people pretending to be sick for work when they're not, and the employees have a very hard time. But if you have a good employer that understands, and I know they've got to be fair and equal to everybody, then then they can inspire a better workmanship and oh, we trust this is the same in the family and in the church. Uh, uh, now, he was also then a generous man. He was devout, which includes fearing God, and he was a generous man. He gave alms. That doesn't mean alms are uh, amounts of money that are given away. It, A-L-M-S. He gave much to the people. Um, the words used in Isaiah 32, verse 8, that the liberal devises liberal things, and by liberal things he shall stand. It doesn't mean liberal in the sense we think of today, but generous. He goes about in a generous way, and he is enabled to stand by his generosity. And that word there is translated in the Greek version of the Old Testament, the same word as we have here but to do good for others is one of the characteristics of a godly man he's not just concerned about himself we read in uh, Romans on Wednesday <coughs> evening in chapter 12 um, to do when you get on to the practical section in the epistle to the Romans chapter 12 and verse 10 be kindly affection affection one to another with brotherly love in honour preferring one another so actually rather than just thinking what, what can I get thinking well what can I do for someone else it's an amazing attitude we see it in um, King David well, I love the story of when he gets his servant Zebra and he says is there anyone left of Saul's household that I can do something good kind to he looks out is there someone I can do something kind to? Particularly because he's taken over from Saul, he doesn't want them to be enemies, but nevertheless, it's kind. And he finds this poor man, Mephibosheth, who's lame, and he brings him in and he looks after him. A man from nowhere, a place called Lodabar, nowhere and nothing, it means. He comes from nowhere and nothing. And he gives him, sits him at the king's table and looks after him. Kindness. Uh, to those uh, rather undeserving and yet although Cornelius was gave much to the people you could say as I maybe intimated at the beginning he might have been doing that to keep people quiet to keep things sweet well that's that's not a bad thing showing kindness to to keep people on board as it were it's not bribing people you mean you mustn't bribe people as such but uh, to be kind and generous and uh, keep people happy by being thoughtful 
towards them is a good thing. Now, um, of course, this is an outworking of his general devotion, his general fearing God, because God commands us to love our neighbours. He's not trying to save himself by his good works. He, he, um, he wouldn't be a man who could say, well, I've given all this money away. God thinks I'm pretty good. I, I don't think that was Cornelius's attitude here at all. But it came out of his love for God and therefore his love for his fellow creatures, that he would want to do good things um, to them. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 3 is very clear that good works of giving cannot save. Paul says, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity or Christian love, it profiteth me nothing. You could give away everything you had. And in fact, someone I was reading was saying, it's actually easier if you get a, the, a charity letter through the post, you think, oh, I could give them some money. Don't I feel good about myself? Now, I'm not saying that's wrong, but it's easy to do that, to give to the poor and to feel good about it, than it is to, to, to love your immediate neighbours. Do it in, a, in an anonymous way. Oh, I've given so much to someone there, but I'm not going to do anything to you. I'm not going to help you. But you're people that you're close to. Where, so that's just a challenge that someone who does the one can't make themselves right with God. Our commandments in the Bible, it puts brotherly love loving the others in the church particularly but that doesn't exclude loving neighbours and indeed enemies giving to those who are very against us to be kind to all all men um, just to say that, that that giving itself doesn't make anybody right with God but it's a sign it's more of a fruit that the man's heart I believe here Cornelius was truly a devout man he did this in the fear of God he didn't give uh, trying to bribe God or something with saying well look what I've done I must now uh, deserve this now so that's 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 the next thing with him then he was he was a good gentleman are we generous now we ask these questions are we devout do we fear God are we he's he's not even a Christian and he's like this and Sometimes people say, well, look at these people in the world. They, they are looking after orphans here and they're doing good works. They're kind. This is man who helps his neighbour. He takes a shopping every week and he's not a Christian. What about us? Are we put to shame by the goodness of some? I'm not saying everybody in the world is like that, but it, 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 we certainly shouldn't be shamed um, by not being good and well this is one characteristic that does stand out for him here he prayed to God always he prayed to God so he did in his fear of God one of the aspects of this is that he he prayed to God now of course again there are lots of people who just pray they can pray for hours about all sorts of things and yet they're not really praying to God is a God of their imagination whereas we presume here that Cornelius as he feared God and although he did he tried to do good works he he knew like there's another centurion in Luke chapter 7 and they said of that man Lord he's a worthy man he's built us a synagogue he's 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 built us a synagogue therefore go and help him he's he's worthy and when the man spoke, he said, I'm not worthy. So he looks worthy, but in his heart, he's worthy because he knows that he's not really worthy. Because he's got a fear of God. He knows who he is, and he knows who God is. And so he needs to pray. He needs to pray. And Cornelius is a man of prayer. I wonder how he prayed. 
Um, <clears throat> he obviously didn't fear man because he prayed to God. He wasn't ashamed. It was known. It was known that he prayed. Um, <clears throat> and like Daniel in um, the book of Daniel, there's a Daniel. You remember they banned people praying to the real God. What did Daniel do? He prayed to the real God because he feared God. He knew he must pray. He knew he mustn't be put off by what others were saying. And it's the same today, isn't it? There's <laughs> There are things put across to Christians. No, you can't say. Yes, we can because the Bible says there is one God. The other gods will be quite polite and friendly towards people that worship other gods. But they're false gods. And we, 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 we haven't got to be ashamed to say that they're not real. Uh, Buddha doesn't know the way to heaven. Muhammad doesn't know the way to heaven. Only Jesus Christ is the way, the truth and the life. Only he died to save us from our sins. We couldn't be righteous. If we were as devout as devout, feared God, gave all away our money, prayed continually, we still wouldn't be righteous. We need Jesus Christ to save us from our sins. And it's to, but it is interesting that it's to such a man as this that an angel comes. And it's not an angel giving a false message. And again, I give the example of the one that's supposed to come to, to uh, Muhammad that told him that Jesus didn't die on a cross and stuff, stuff like that. Can't be a true angel. But this angel here appears and um, tells him that his prayers have been heard and that, that God is going to now help him. And he arranges then for his men to go and see Peter. So all this effort, as it were, all the things that can't save Cornelius himself, his devoutness, no one's saved by their devotion. No one's saved by just fearing God. No one's saved by giving away money. No one's saved by praying. Though we should do all these things. But this man is seeking the Lord. Are you seeking the Lord? Do you care? Are you just concerned for the things of today? Or are you concerned about where you stand with God? Now I, I put it to you that we, we, we're not expecting an angel to suddenly arrive and send us off somewhere but that God does know us, God does know exactly what we're doing and we see here that when the time comes, when he hears an angel to point him to Peter who will teach him about Jesus Christ he's ready to obey God and well how how would we, how, how could we ever know about God? Devoted, fearing God, and I, I hope you are, seeking to do good and praying. There are people like that, they've gone on for years and years like that. In their religion, maybe they follow Roman Catholicism, maybe they follow uh, Buddhism or Islam, or they go to Church of England wishy-washy version and yet they're quite serious and they, they've got they want to do the right thing well, how, the Bible says that there's no one that's really seeking after God strange isn't it but Jesus says seek and you will find knock and the door will be open he encourages people to try to make an effort to, to turn to God but it's clear in uh, Romans chapter 10 that faith, without faith, true faith, we can't please God. And faith comes by hearing. Now, I'm going to try and almost going to contradict everything we've said so far. It doesn't necessarily come to people like Cornelius although God knew that this was the right man 
to choose and to use and that the things that are put of Cornelius are highly commendable but the I think the great the greatest thing here is when is that he sees the angel and he obeys and he, he sends men and then as we see later on Peter comes and Cornelius believes on the Lord Jesus Christ that's the thing that's really needed but that comes a bit later but it comes through hearing about Jesus Christ that's the only thing that can save anybody is putting our trust for our sins the fact that that we are in ourselves we've got thoughts that are me they're not God thoughts that are going on we're, we're, we're planning our own empire as it were as if we want to be the centurion in charge but we're not going to bother about God because we're in charge that there's a whole attitude that goes on there and so it disobeys God's commandments to love God, to worship God. It puts ourselves in place of God. It's, the, it's as it were, the, the greatest disobedience to God is to not love God, to not have God as our God, but to take our own selves in place of God. In the world, that can look, it can look impressive. You could look like Cornelius, a great centurion, but have no fear of God, not be devout, uh, 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 and uh, 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 not be a man of prayer, and people could think you're something, you've made something of yourself. But Cornelius knew that was vain. To make life around yourself is vain. We must seek the Lord. And it was in this seeking, and I know it's all God's grace, and he chooses people from all sorts of unlikely avenues but he does choose some from the higher class of people now if we can't make ourselves centurions to start with we, we may be whatever state we're in we're to seek the Lord but all these works however good we try and be if we could say well, I want to be like Cornelius I want to be a good person we're never ever going to do it but uh, what happens then when he when Peter comes he tells him that Jesus Christ is the one who was anointed by God he is the way it, it comes towards he raised him the third day the end of the chapter and though it's not all explained in this chapter fully that Christ died for sinners this is the beginning of a relationship with God. Uh, I haven't set out to speak too much on this now. You've, you've heard it many a time that because of our sinful nature, all our good works can never make us right with God. One sin, and we've failed, we've, we've fallen short of the glory of God. But in Jesus Christ dying on the cross, he was dying as we are here on Good Friday, in place of sinners, to bear the, 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 the wrath of God. And he is the righteous saviour. And all that trust in him, that believe, yes, God sent him in my place to die on the cross and to rise again the third day. And he reigns in heaven. And if I trust in him and turn to him for his mercy, I'll be completely accepted by God and belong to him be even more wonderful than someone like Cornelius was well this is what I say happens to Cornelius and um, we'll, we'll see it at another time this is just a part of how God brings the gospel to the Gentiles this man could never have expected by his sinful life really although he was a wealthy man his, his heart was set for I want to do the things that are right with God and he was so specially used in this case that an angel came, the apostle Peter came, and then ultimately the Holy Spirit came, and he was one of the great early uh, Christians from the Gentile world, the first one given this privilege of being baptized. And so the blessing came to him, real blessing came and I, 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 we'll see this again another time but 
in a way, everybody wants blessings, don't they? Everyone wants good. We've nearly finished. Everyone wants good things to happen. The best. What can I do with my life? What's the best thing I can do? And well, the Bible's full of warning, isn't it? The danger of hell, but the promise of blessing in Jesus Christ. You maybe you you haven't really quite grasped the idea of what it is to be a Christian. Maybe you. You, you, you don't feel you're quite there you've got some of it and you can see there's something good in it and I say well persevere persevere in devoutness seek the Lord day by day read the Bible pray to God do good things but above all seek what it is what is it about Jesus Christ that I lack there's something that you've got that you're going on and on about and it sounds like you've got peace with God but I maybe uh, maybe you I am so I'm talking for you I maybe you feel that you haven't really got a solid base with God in Jesus Christ is there something not there well be like Cornelius go 100% at it say well I've got some spare time what should I do should I watch the telly no I'm gonna read the Bible I want to find out about Jesus Christ. I want to persist. I want to ask questions. Go and be like Cornelius. Find people like us, I trust, who know about Jesus Christ. People that are close to God. Say, I want to be close to God like you are. Show me. Tell me more. Is there something I've missed about, about the doctrine of God? About the doctrine of sin? about why I'm not right with God, what's the matter in the world? There are lots of questions. Now, if, if people ask these questions, if people are serious about God, Jesus Christ promises that you will find out. You'll, you'll discover, if you belong to another religion, you'll, you'll discover why it doesn't work, why it's wrong. And you'll discover why Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And, well, you will, if you come to Jesus Christ, you will find that this sense of devoutness and the fear of God and, and the need to obey God and to love your neighbour and to pray, it increases. It becomes even more. It, you think it becomes more difficult in a sense. But God... God will lead you, he'll be your God, he'll be with you, and he'll never leave you. And in, in this world, I tell you, the more you go through it, and some of you have been through it, I know, you'll know what it's really about, and that Jesus Christ is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. But be serious about it. Don't be half-hearted. Don't just show up at church and go home and get on with everything else. Seek the Lord, be devout, be sincere. Cornelius was. And he was blessed. And if you seek the Lord with your whole heart, he won't disappoint you. He will give you his very best. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.